Hey everyone, we're just taking a little bit to set up still. Uh, thank you for your patience. We'll be starting problems here shortly. Alright, I think we're ready to get started here. So today, uh, I have a final coming up in a week, <laughs> so I'm studying for finals. Uh, and it's good and fun, and we're gonna have a grand old time with it. Uh, one thing that I'm really excited about is that we have this! Uh, Erin is kind enough to let me borrow her tablet so I can uh, go like this. We go, hello! I could become an art streamer if I really wanted to. I just draw my characters like this. There he is. That's a new character right there. Um, anyway, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to delete that and I'm going to get the empty head music going. And we're going to get started right away here. So, I have, I'm working out of Null Radiation 4th Edition, the current textbook for that. Pretty fun, pretty exciting time, to be certain. Um, and, I'm just going to do an RNG. So, I have a spreadsheet uh, from 1 from one to 256, I don't know. Nope, you can't see that, it's only on paint. Uh, so, we're just going to go through that way. So, I'm going to start with a random number generator between 1 and 256. Starting with number 85, 85 refers to, let's see here, that is problem 6.4 in null. Okay, let's get back on here, and we will make our size value, yay, 6.4. We're going to start there. All right, so let's go to that in the text. It's on proportional counters. Let's hope this is one that's fairly easily done on stream. Okay. So, let's adjust here, and we'll get started. Again, I'm going to provide some context real quickly. Uh, this... <laughs> I'm going to make... <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to make a bunch of mistakes, but that's okay. A-OK. -okay. A-OK. -okay. Actually, I have an idea. Oh, well, here's an idea. This would make people watch me, I promise. Alright. We're gonna go into studio mode real quick. I am a bold one, Shane. You don't have to tell me twice. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna... <laughs> we're gonna do something different. We're gonna do something real different. Shit. <laughs> Can you tell I'm having a grand old time here? Oh, there we go. Let's, uh... Let's frick around with this a little bit. Where the hell is the pole? Damn it. There it is. Okay, and then we're going to do this. We're going to move this one up a little bit. And then we're going to go into filters. We're going to adjust this a little bit. Oh my gosh, this is embarrassing, man. I hope you all don't mind this. Let's see. I should have set this up beforehand, but I didn't. 
So, you all get to enjoy the struggle of me figuring out how to set this up and have this work. I'm basically just setting up a green screen so that it looks like I'm actually, like, slightly engaged. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Alright, let's get started here. Let's do... Let's do that! Alright, and I do... There's definitely the visible frame, the green screen. You'll just have to deal with that. I don't really care that much. Uh, maybe I do care a little bit, actually. Uh, let's do... Let's like boost that just a wee bit. Oh. Whatever. This will have to do. It's fine for now. It's fine for now. Okay. So, we are working on 6.4. Let's do that. Cool. And my chat is behind me. So, we will put that there. Good stuff. Okay. 6.4. So 6.4 asks, a windowless flow proportional counter is used to detect 5 MeV alphas. We have 5 MeV alpha particles. Okay. Got my tactician hat on everything. Got my school that I'm repping. All is well. All is well. Uh, alpha particles are totally stopped in the fill gas. And the tube has an anode radius. So A is 0 0.5 or 0.005 centimeters. Okay, and the cathode radius, B, is 5.0 centimeters, cool, and then it's filled with P10 gas, so that's argon gas, cool, P10 at, and the pressure equals 1 atmosphere. Using data from table 6.1, uh... Estimate the amplitude of the voltage pulses from the counter for an applied voltage of 2,000 volts and a collection capacitance of 500 picofarads, so 10 to the minus 12 farads. Okay, so I also have my... I left my physical copy of Null at school. So, uh, this webcam was shit. Ugh. We're gonna we're gonna change this so the contrast isn't as bad. Yeah, there we go. That's much better. Aside from the fuzziness, but you know what? We'll just we'll just deal with that. No, we're not gonna deal with that actually. We're not gonna deal with that. We're gonna go to advanced settings and we're gonna no. We're gonna do. No. <laughs> I apologize. This is embarrassing. We're not saving any of those changes. What the hell is going on now? <laughs> Hold on. What is wrong with this? Say, what is wrong with this scene right now? You tell me. You tell me. Because I can see a lot that's wrong. Oh, there we go. Hey, that fixed it. For the most part. Hang on. One more, one more thing. One more thing. One more thing. One more thing. Because I have green in my hat. <laughs> You'll just have to deal with that. Okay, cool. Now it works great. Now it works fantastic. Alright, so we'll lock that and chat. Chat just goes up like that. Okay, cool. So I'll cover up the bottom of chat sometimes, but that's okay. Anyway, so I don't have my copy of Null with me, so I'm, I'm using the PDF, so I'm going to have to scroll to table 6.1. Table 6.1. Okay, for what it's worth, too, um, we are going to be working in a cylindrical base thing, so some relevant equations might be ER equals, you know, this is the equation for the electric field, R, I'm going to be over A. We're working on it. Um, I just gotta get one other thing. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a screenshot of the problem statement. I'm going to slap that boy into... Ah, Dami XD. thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the stream. That looks like terrible, terrible mess, but you know what, we're working with it. Uh, 
Estimate the amplitude of the voltage pulses. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. Nothing drums of interest like physics homework. You are certainly right, Shane. But you know what? It's funny. I told all my friends in higher academia that I was going to do this. So, joke's on you. This is actually interesting to them. Very interesting indeed. Okay, table 6.1. So, P10, for those of you who are curious, we'll first make that this. We'll say there. All right, so P10. That's not a straight line. I'm going to do what the artists do. There we go. P10 is 90% argon. And 10% uh, methane. Right, CH4, that's methane. And so it's got a K value, which is, uh, I need to review what the K value stands for, but it's 4.8 volts per centimeter atmosphere and it's got a delta V of 23.6 okay very cool so the way we can start this problem the way we start because we're we're estimating the voltage pulses right yeah we're estimating voltage pulses so we are working with six point. We want to consider. Hey, Snake! Thank you so much for the subscription. Hello, I've arrived to express how I'm feeling about my finals. Ah! To be continued. Yes, I, I agree. I really, really agree. Also, I realize my hat is covering up the right side of the screen, so maybe I'll try to avoid doing that down the line. Let's see. That's like right here. Okay. We'll leave that space open. So, we're working with this proportional counter. So the first thing that I'm assuming with proportional counters is if we are looking for the multiplication, since that is going to give us a charge, which then gives us a voltage, since voltage equals Q over C. And Q in this case is going to be the number of electron carriers times the multiplication. This is really important. So it's the number of ion pairs times the electric charge times the multiplication. And so we know <clears throat> so we know the energy of the alphas. We know the radius of this detector, and we know all of this. All of this information here is going to be used to find the multiplication. So this E value is going to be, I believe it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb. We're estimating the voltage pulses. Yeah, I know, right? The irony, the motherfucking irony of my username being basically all of my math. So we're looking for the gas multiplication factor, and we can find that actually pretty explicitly uh, with equation 6.10 in null, where it's the natural log of that equals ln of b over a over the natural log of 2 over delta v. See, that's what we got the table from. And then we have this expression where we have the natural log of v times p. A, which is that radius, let me rewrite that. PA, the natural log of B over A again, minus the natural, oh, that's gonna be there, minus the natural log of A. So this is just plug and chug, basically, because once we get this expression here, we can find the multiplication, and then I believe we know the number. That was given to us in the problem, wasn't it? Uh, okay, this is 5 MV. Okay, that's a good start. We can at least solve for the multiplication first. And then from there, let's see. If we, let's see, where, where do I want to go? Let's see, let's see, let's see. Because the number of ion pairs is the, uh, the other thing we need to know is the number of ion pairs. That is given as E over W. And this E is that energy we have. And W is the number of ion pairs created per electron. So I need to find this W value. But, oh no, did my thing disconnect? Totally good. I'm living the dream, everyone. Living the dream of what art streamers do on a regular basis where their tablet gets disconnected. There we go. Okay. So W for P10 
What is W? That's like 26, I want to say. It's something. It's it's in null, so we're gonna look for that now. Uh, where are the values of W? That's the real question. There it is. Okay, for P10. Yes, it is 26. So that's going to be 26 EV per ion pair. And this is just the energy that's required to... Um, this is how much energy it needs to create an ion pair in the gas. And these ion pairs are what are going to be providing our voltage poles. So, couldn't that... Yes, it could. But it's a lot more explicit in this regard. The reason we don't compress this, this equation here, is because we want this expression for the tube itself, because this is like the electric field in the tube uh, in addition to the pressure. And then this term here, this K, that is related to, if I remember this K value correctly, where, one again. It's a fill gas detector. Uh, K represents the minimum value of electric field divided by pressure below which multiplication can't occur. So that's a really important term that we want on its own. But yes, you could do that. You could also do that with a natural log here too. But this guy here, this guy you don't want to compress into this one as well. It's kind of like you can, but you don't have to. You probably shouldn't. It's, it's a lot more explicit this way. So, the natural log of M. Alright, so this is what we're going to solve. M, and we know that our applied voltage is 2,000 volts. We know the natural log of B, which was, what, 5 centimeters? Yeah, 5 centimeters and 0 0.005 centimeters. Over 0 0.005 centimeters. And that is times the natural log of 2. Yeah over this delta V term, which was uh, 23.6. 23.6, and that is going to have units again of, I don't think it's volts, I think it's something else. No, it is volts, okay. Yeah, that makes sense because the voltages should cancel out there. And then you have the natural log of, again, 2,000 volts over one atmosphere times A, which is again 0 0.005 centimeters. And all of that times the natural log again of 5 centimeters over 0 0.005 centimeters. Right? Cool. And then minus the natural log, and that makes the units work too because it's volts over atmosphere per second. Okay, cool. That's great. Good. Good gut check. Always check your units. Uh, we have the natural log of P10, which is 4 volts per centimeter. Alright, so that's our multiplication. Very cool. And let's plug that into our gosh dang calculator. This guy. Really cool. Okay. Yes, good morning. Happy Sunday. Hope you all are doing very well. Because, oh boy! Finals, baby. Natural log of 2 divided by 26. Six. No, let's see. Let's do it this way. Nope, that's not what I wanted. Okay. So it's going to be, nope, scroll a little bit here, nope. that is going to be 8.5, I'm just writing down intermediate numbers, not 5, 6, 5, 0, 3, uh, 5, 0, 3, 7, let's actually make that 5, 0, 4, let's round up to 3, 6, big. uh, okay. And that is going to be unitless. <clears throat> cool. And then we have the natural log of, let's see, 2,000 divided by 1, so whatever 
uh, 0 0.005 times the natural log of 5 over 0 0.005. Too many zeros? I wish I could show you my calculator, but unfortunately I cannot at this point. So that's going to be 10. 966. Six. Uh, we'll just say the 7 for convenience, minus the natural log of 4.8. I really don't want to imagine a, a non-natural log equation of this, neither do I. And the natural log of 4.8. Sig figs, what are those? I don't know. Uh, minus... Minus 1.569, nice. All right, so now let's just subtract these guys. Very cool. So it's gonna be natural log of M equals 8.504. This should also be unit extent. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, and this is gonna be times 9.398. Cool. All right, let's multiply that together. Let's see what we get, and then take the natural log of that, so that m is going to equal 4.3. Oh my lord! All right, let's try this again. We're all. This is the first time I'm actually doing this live on stream, so we're gonna we're gonna make it work, right? Right, gang. I'm glad you feel the same. <laughs> glad you feel the same. Okay. M, oh boy, gotta remember that that's there too. So M is going to be our multiplication factor, our gas multiplication factor. It's 4.3.8.1. That's number one. Uh, apologies if you don't like how I draw my <clears throat> numbers for what it's worth. So again, we return to this equation where we have N naught E M over the capacitance. Yes, yes, the capacitance. Very important number. Okay, and then n naught is equal to e. So we know e was given to us as five MeV, five MeV alphas. So we'll need to convert that to just regular electron volts. And W for this again we found was thirty. Nope, twenty six, and that's eV per ion. So I'm going to thus remove this MEV business because it has no business being there. And I'm going to make this 5 times 10 to the 6th EV. Pretty straightforward. So we have 5 times 10 to the 6th divided by 26. So N should be 192... 308 ion. Alright. So, we know this multiplication. We know that this pulse, for what it's worth, should be probably on the uh, order of like millivolts, I want to say. <clears throat> Us engineers ain't using them damn sig figs. Y'all go to scientist if you want huge damn sig figs. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so we have 192 308 ion pairs. Times 1.6 times, ooh, let's try that again, times 10, is it minus 19? <laughs> oh, snake. Uh, Coulombs times 4.3, was it 381? Yeah, 381. And then we divide all that by, was it 200? 500 picovolts, or picofarads, excuse me. 500 Five hundred times ten to the minus twelve farads. And looking at this, this is an order of like ten to the five. So this is gonna bring us down. That's gonna be a single, and that should be like ten to the ten. So that should get us, I think, in the range of where we expect it to be. Let's do the calculation and find out. Alright, so that's gonna be multiplied times. Ten to the minus nineteen. Times 4.381 divided by 500 times 10 to the minus 12. And that's going to give us. Oh, 
It's not that. That is going to give us a voltage of 2.69. Nope, scratch that. Uh, 26.9. 26.96 millivolts, is that right? No. Hang on, let's just write it out the way the calculator gave it to me. Hey, Saudi, welcome. Uh, this is going to be 2.696 times 10 to the minus 4 volts. That's pretty close to the order I would expect. It's a little... Um, it's a little low. Or if we want to put it in millivolts, that will be 0 0.2696 millivolts. It's a little low, all things considered, but I think this is on the same order of magnitude that we would expect. So I feel good about this answer. Um, but yeah, a millivolt answer is about what you would expect from the size of proportional counter. When was the last time I ate and drank water? Uh, like an hour ago? Now? Second time is right now. I just spilled all over myself. Anyway. I'm not gonna make the airplane joke. I'm not gonna make it. And now to conclude, we're gonna we're gonna do a little doodle. It's gonna be good. A really nice little fun little doodle. Uh yeah. Nope, that's terrible. Nope, that's also terrible. Yep, it's great. And then we just scroll up a little bit. It's great. It's Kerb. Kirby. Look at him. He's got a little bulbous hat. He's Chef Kirby. There he is, and look, he's got a frying pan. There you go. All right, let's uh, save this biz, put it in ski wool. We'll do, uh, do uh, problems. Problem. All right, this is a uh, six point. Four. Cool. All right. New problem. New problem. Uh, get someone in chat. Give me a number. Uh, one to two fifty-six. Seven. All right, Shane. We'll go with seven. We'll go with number seven. I hope you're happy. That is just literally going to be problem one point seven in the text, but. I'm glad that you chose a question that, like, just because it's chapter one does not mean it's easy. All right, so let's do this. Let's do this. All right. 1.7. All right. Here we go. Pi, there is no question pi snake. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. All right. Here we go. Here is the problem statement for this one. What is the highest energy to which doubly ionized helium atoms can accelerate in a DC accelerator with a 3 megavolt maximum voltage. I need to look this up because, like, I deadass don't remember. <laughs> Alright, highest energy. So let's look for doubly ionized bits, you know? Dude, where's my double ionization? Uh, okay. I think this is a pretty straightforward one, right? Like, is this not just, hang on, let's think about this for a bit. Let's consider the energy of like, fucking this. Also, yes, I have chosen the music to be like, especially amusing when I'm like trying to think and I look like, an, a, like a, a genuine fool. Okay, Snake, next time I'm going to ask you to pick an integer, and it's going to have to be pop. Okay. 
Okay, let's think about this. Okay. So the highest energy to which a doubly ionized can be accelerated. Okay, so let's just think about this for a sec. So if we're accelerating with three megavolts, that means that our delta E is going to be three times 10 to the sixth volts. Okay. And doubly ionized helium atoms. So what's the charge on that? That's going to be... Because... Is it not just V equals QE? I think that's what it is. Let me look at that up real quick. Let me let me just Google that equation to make sure I'm not crazy. V equals QE. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, no, that's the force. That's the equation of the force for an electric field. Um... What is my... Does that make sense? Uh, da, 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 da. All right, let's 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 think about this. Natural numbers. This doesn't feel like a maximum voltage at the moment. <sighs> no, this isn't the equation. Sorry. I've lied to you all. Um, e equals QV. That's what we're looking for. All right, so in this case, if we have a delta E, then we want times delta V. This is what we're looking for right here. So, now we just need to know what our Q is, and alpha particles are helium nuclei with two protons. So I want to say that's a plus two charge. I'm pretty sure that's a plus two charge. I'm overthinking it, and I'm on stream, so I'm always going to be, like, second-guessing myself. But, um, yeah... I believe that is just going to be... Let's have a look at this problem one more time just to be certain. I don't want to look like a fool on a really straightforward question. Okay. And this is not delta E, excuse me. This should be delta V. Because I've misinterpreted the prompt, like I always do. Alright, let's try this. Okay. So we have delta E, which is the energy, is going to be 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb times 3 times 10 to the 6th volts. So that should give us our answer. That should be pretty straightforward. So let's calculate. 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 times... 3 times 10 to the 6th. Is that right? That's going to be 9.6 9. times 10 to the minus 13, and that's going to be in... What is that going to be? Units of... Electron volts, I want to say? No, this is, this is not right. I've clearly made a fool of myself. This should be... No, sorry. The highest energy... 3 MeV... Uh, megavolts maximum volt. Yeah, so this is the voltage change, right? Yeah, this is our maximum potential difference. So therefore, the maximum energy is Q times that. So it's 2. 2. Hang on, let me just... Let's get rid of... Uh, here, what I'm going to do instead, that may be more straightforward if I think about it this way, is I'll instead do... Be 2q times 3 times 10 to the 6. And that is going to be basically 6 MeV. Because if we treat q like a 1, basically, like a, just an electron charge, it should be approximately 6 MeV. 
Which I think in the context of this is more likely what they're looking for. Yeah, I feel pretty good about that. Yeah, okay. Uh, now we're going to draw something. What are we going to draw? What do we draw? What do we draw? What do we draw? Uh, no, I don't have an answer key. So that's why I'm like vibing, kind of. We'll draw. And we don't flip the canvas here. No one flips the canvas. Flipping the canvas is for cowards. And then, uh, what kind of hair does he have? He's got the, uh, got this kind where it swoops down in front. Yeah, like that. And he's got the. Yeah. Nope, that's too wide. It's too wide. I don't know who this is, but now they are engraved in the canon of the streams. And there's this gear right there. Here, here. And then, uh. What's their name? This is, uh... This is, um... Edmund... Frederick... Fred... Frederick... Jones... That's his... That's him right there. That's him. See? That's him. Cool. Alright, let's save this guy and move on to the next one. Uh, 1.7. Alright. New problem. Integer. Positive integer between 1 and 256. Lay it on me, baby. <sighs> and in the meantime... We will... I'll just RNG one, and then we'll get the next question in. So, between 1 and 256, we have number 149. 149? That is problem 11.9. Let's do it. Thank you for the clip, Snake. Oh my god, there's four clips already. Oh lord. Okay, 11.9. So this is going to be on semiconductors, so that's going to be a fun problem all the same. 11.9. Oh, lord. This is going to be hard. This is going to be real difficult. Ha! All right. Here we go. The primary alpha peak from an americium 241 calibration source was centered in the channel number 461 in a multi-channel analyzer when the alpha particles were collimated to be perpendicular to the surface of a silicon junction detector. The geometry was then changed to cause the alpha particles to be incident at an angle of 35 degrees to the normal, and the observed peak was shifted to channel 455. Assuming no zero offset in the MCA, find the dead layer thickness in units of alpha energy loss. Okay, so let's start off here. First we have theta one, which is going to be perpendicular, so that's 90 degrees. And theta 2, which is going to be uh, 35 degrees. We know channel number, uh, which is going to be 461. We know channel 2 is 455. So what we're looking for is an energy loss. Yeah. Or the thickness of the dead layer. And we can determine this because the channel number is directly proportional to uh, the voltage in this case. Uh, no, Brian, my prelim does not have a math subject. Basically, the qualifying exam, the way it works, is I have two three-hour exams that are solely related to radiation detection and measurement, but they're on anything. So just two three-hour exams. It's pretty 
straightforward compared to uh, Wisconsin finals or quals. Thank you, Snake. Thank you so much for tuning in. Glad to have you here. All right, so semiconductors, semiconductors. Let's all play around with semiconductors. These are the things that I need to know anyway. So we're looking for the dead layer thickness in terms of units of alpha energy loss. So that also tells me that this is going to have some component of BEDX probably in it. Minus BEDX. Because that is going to be the energy loss per thickness, per distance traveled. So we're going to be looking for something like this probably. So let's just uh, let's go through the book and find some fun. Uh -huh. Energy loss measurements by particle identification. Section D of chapter 11. That's just what I'm looking for. My so-called nuclear engineer does not qualify for your study then. I'm sorry to hear that. I am just working on radiation detection and measurement, so... Congrats on passing your defense, by the way. Very excited for you. Alright, so this problem... First of all, let's consider this difference, right? Because this is going to be an energy difference. I can draw. That's going to be final minus energy initial. I think that's a smart instance. Let's look for an appropriate equation, though. Oh, that's, that's probably one that's relevant. Uh, this is equation uh, 11.22 in null. This is going to be the change in energy of the, or it's the, excuse me, the energy loss in the dead layer. Crazy, right? It's going to be d e d naught over dt, or excuse me, dx, times t. Wow, who would have guessed, right? Where the thickness is given by the dead layer. The energy loss for an angle of incidence is given by delta e theta, which is, again, what we have. Uh, that is going to be equal to delta E naught over cosine of theta. So therefore, the difference between the measured pulse height angles for the angle instance of zero and theta is given as that. So, what we could do is we have delta E zero, uh, excuse me, E prime equals delta E zero, one over cosine of theta one, Jeez, that's not a one. Do that. Minus, uh, no, excuse me, this should be two. Minus cosine of theta one. And that makes sense because in the book, if the angle of incidence for cosine of theta is one or zero, then the cosine is one. So the book gives this as if this angle were zero. Let me just make sure though that this is a, Cosine of 90 should be zero, which is not good. <laughs> uh, yeah, because this is perpendicular. Except what we can do... Except what we can do is we could just do a change of, uh, angle, so to speak. So, like, initially, so, the change in... So, excuse me, this should be 35 degrees plus 90. So we could just make this to be theta 1. If we just change the geometry a little bit, theta 1 is equal to 0 degrees, and theta 2 is equal to 35 degrees. Change of orientation. Cool. So, we basically boil down to E prime equals D e0 over dx times t over 1 minus cosine of 35 minus 1. Pretty straightforward, right? <clears throat> so we know this, at least. And so all we need to do is multiply this out, right? Yeah, I think that's all we need to do. The question is, we don't have an exact expression for this guy yet. This, uh, this D, this, this guy right here, you know? Draw a diagram. Okay, I will draw a diagram, only because you asked me. 
So we have basically the particles are coming in. They're coming in here. So if this is our surface, right? They're coming in like so. Now this is uh this is for beta one. And now they're coming in at a degree, an angle that is 35 degrees to the normal. And this is for theta two. And we're looking and so the uh the uh the uh peak. So therefore the peak at these different angles has moved from here to here. That's basically what we're we're getting out of this. <sighs> Let's see. Let me just make sure I wrote down the equations correctly. Um, equation 11.23. Oh, this is for pulse height. Excuse me. I don't want this. I don't want that. I don't want that. No. I don't want that. What I want instead is all I need to do Say that delta E theta equals DE zero DX T over cosine theta. That's what I want. That is what I'm working with here. And so I realize this diagram is right behind my head in chat. So we'll deal with that. But this T is going to be useful for us. And I think I don't want to say it's as easy as just plugging everything in because we we need to consider the relationship between everything, right? We need to we need to convert these channel heights appropriately. I think that's the only thing that's keeping us from solving at this point. I think we need to look at americium decay, because I need to know the energy of the alpha particle. Because that should give me, ideally, a linear relationship between the alphas. Yeah. And I need to find a way to convert this energy into a channel number. That's the other issue I'm facing. <laughs> so, this delta E term, or excuse me, this E, this E term here, if I were to write that, let's see, if I do E alpha, right, if we do that, and that's going to be D E DX times T, and then if we add a term, that's, um, call that C for the channel number, right? And then we need some linear freaking whatever term to like make sure it scales appropriately. What value should I use here? Let's use N. Let's just use N there. So this is going to be, so this C term, we're going to find C as the channel number. And that's given. And this N is just going to be a scaling factor, basically. No. No, 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 no. We need, we need this to work out. So this is going to be the units to work out. So this is going to be an energy... So this is going to be energy per channel. Yeah. Cool. So we need to figure out how much energy per channel there is as well. Yes. Okay. I like that better. So let's find out how much the energy of the americium is. Uh, I gotta find that. That's something to think about. Uh, it's a pretty common thing though, right? Like americium's got energy of an alpha of like, what, five something? Yeah, 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 yes. The, the, the common, so the E alpha for americium 
is approximately 5.486 MeV per table 1.3 in null. Uh, and this is gonna be like 85% of the time, which like good enough for me. <laughs> All right, so we know the total energy of this alpha and we're trying to get this guy here. Let's see, let's see. This is tricky. Like, we need the peak to be at this energy, right? This is a hard problem. This is this is difficult. This is this one's really difficult, not gonna lie. I'm feeling like Okay, well let's let's write delta E equals E final minus E initials. Yeah, there's two equations, there's two unknowns. I'm just figuring out what I wanna solve for here, right? Like that's really what it boils down to. Yeah. Yeah, so we have the initial. N and T. Yep. Yep, so we have this channel number. We have this guy. Yes. So solve N and T. And this is our equation one. And where is our other equation? I believe it's this guy. That feels right. Let's try that. Let's try that. Um. Yeah. Oh, and I feel like there needs to be the channel number here as well. You know? Right? I feel like that is needed here. Yeah. Yeah. So let's here. We'll we'll drag this guy. We'll move you over here. And then I think we need a CN term here as well. Because that's gonna give us the change in energy from that. I believe that's the case. Let me just make sure. Let me convince myself first. I don't think it's exactly this is the thing, you know? I think there's a difference between this channel number and this channel number. It should give the same E alpha. I agree. I agree, these two should be the same. But then that just makes that this and this are the same. So I think that there's a difference here, you know? Uh, no, these ends will be different. No, 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 no. Let me think this through. Yeah, C1 and C2. Yeah. Why don't we just do that? C1 and C2. Yeah, these are constants. No. Yeah, solving. We're solving for N and T. I was thinking we were solving for C for some reason. We're not. Okay. So our equations are basically. We'll write down them again. Just write them down again, just to be like consistent. E alpha equals DE and DX times T plus C. We're going to change this one to C1, by the way, uh, for the sake of consistency. Yes, okay. Okay, so we have DET and then we have equation two, which, oh no, did my thing gum unplugged? It did. Come on. Alrighty. Now we have this beautiful tunes of me trying to get this reconnected. There we go. Oh, it was working for a sec. And then it stopped. 
There we go. All right, we're back in business. And then equation two, which is uh, E, it's E alpha, since, yeah, that should be the same. And that's going to be equal to this DEO cosine of CN2. We're gonna copy that, we're gonna paste that, and I'm gonna rewrite it. Don't want it to be nicer. Let's do that. And this DE, DX, T is all just like one thing. That's like the other variable. Plus C2. Okay. All right, so we have our two equations. Now we need to develop a relationship between C1 and C2, right? And I also feel like this N is different as well. No, these, no, these are the same. These are the same. Nope, we're good. So these now, we just have our C's and we have our thing. So we have two equations with three unknowns. We have C1, C2, and DEDT, DXT. So we need to find a relationship between C1 and C2. Where C... Wait. I'm dumb because we are, we need to, I should list my knowns better. Oh, and my thing's unplugged again. Don't worry about me. I'm just, you know, sometimes I forget what I have already in my toolbox. Alright, so we know... We know cosine of theta. We know C1. We know C2. So, and we know... Yeah. So, we have two equations and two unknowns, so we can solve. Very cool. Alright. So let's put these two together and do some algebra, shall we? So I'm gonna just first off make D E D X T. I'm just gonna write this as T for the uh, convenience. So we have T plus C one N equals T over cosine theta plus C two. And so we just want to isolate one of these equations. I have a feeling it's going to be easier to, well, let's just do some algebra and find out for ourselves. All right, so we have t minus t over cosine of theta equals c2 minus c1 times n, right? Yep, cool. Uh, n's going to be probably easier to solve for, I think. No, we're solving for the thickness, though. I think. Well, let's just let's just solve for n. So that's gonna be t times one minus one over cosine of theta over c two minus c one. Let's plug that bad boy in to uh, one of our beautiful equations. Like equation one, for example. Use that linear algebra skills. Ugh. Matrices? Who are they? I don't know those. So we have E alpha equals, uh, <coughs> excuse me, T plus C1 T. 1 minus 1 over cosine of theta. C2 minus C1. And we know that E alpha equals 5.486 MeV. We know C1 equals 461, is it? Right? That's what the problem said, right? 
Great. Uh, 461, yep. And C2 is uh, 455. And theta equals 35 degrees. So, we know all this, and we can plug this in and solve for T. <clears throat> Let's do that now. Going through each step very explicitly may be like a lot of extra work, but in the learning process, sometimes it must be done. And I'm actually going to take this T out of here. I'm going to factor a T out of everything. 1 plus uh, 461. 1 minus 1 over cosine of 35 degrees over 461 minus 4. Right? Let's just make sure we did that right. Looks good. Cool. So, T is going to be equal to 5.486 MeV over 1 plus 1 minus 1 over cosine of 35 degrees over 461 minus 455. And then we can plug that in and find out. Well, let's do that now. 486 divided by 1 plus... Is 1 minus 1 over cosine of 35, or co- or cosecant. Nope, secant. Did I drop a 461? Yes, I did. Thank you. I did. There we go. And I see my mistake immediately. Thank you, Brian. <coughs> Pardon me. 461. Divided by 461 minus 45. And that will give us... It does give us a negative number, but I feel like... In the context of this question, the units of this are going to be not thickness, but they're going to be given in terms of alpha energy loss, if I'm remembering this right. Yeah, in units of alpha energy loss. So this is going to be 0 0.344, and then the units on T, the units on T are actually DE, DX, DT. So this is going to be uh, alpha, and I believe that's MeV per minus, it is in degrees, yes. I will verify that now. Cosine of 90 should be zero. It is. Cool. Yep. So it's going to be minus 0 0.344 MeV per what is the length unit? What is this length unit? Uh, that is the question, isn't it? Per some length, and I must have missed it somewhere. Let's see if I've missed it somewhere. Units of alpha energy loss. What do you think? That's probably going to be in... Yeah, so you're losing energy as it goes through. Yeah, exactly. That's why we have a negative value. I just don't know what this distance unit would be, you know? And this is going to be in channel number... I suppose I need to find that, don't I? Let's see. Let me look at a... Uh... What do you think this is going to be? What would that unit be? Do you think it would be like in microns, you think? I think it, it's either millimeters or microns, because nanometers is far too thin, and meters is like... Let's be real here. Centimeters? I feel like centimeter is too thick, though. New T has units of energy. No, it. this should be... This should have a distance component to it. Like, the channel value should have a 
distance, I think. Let me look again. I'm looking at null. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to find the specific energy loss for uh, alphas per energy. And there's... Chapter 2 has that for... Yeah, it's KEV per micrometer. Oh, yeah, you are right. It is going to be in uh, units of energy. Thank you, Brian. So then... Yeah, because this is unitless. Okay, that makes more sense. So let's do... Let's do away with that. Hey, Lucari. Welcome. Thank you so much for the follow. Welcome to the stream. Uh, but yeah, it's like 0 0.344 MeV or 344 KV. Something like that. No, that's how much it's losing. That's how much it's losing. It's not negative energy. This is how much it's losing over distance. So I've done something wrong here where I need to figure out how much it's... Uh, Need to figure out how much this because for alphas here I'll show you this. Ooh, I'm gonna have to expand the the freaking workspace. Oh boy. Oh, that's too big. All right, let's go down here. Yes, that's okay. You can zone out with this. I fully expected that. All right, so this is a this is table two point nine and null. So we're working. Let's use red here. So we're looking at these alphas. And we, we are working with, Amarison, these are going to be like, what, 5 MeV or so? That's going to be right around here. Nope, that's helium. Nope, I can't draw. Mallow Mort, yeah. Let's draw a straight line there, see what we get. What the hell am I looking at? You're looking at my homework. You're looking at my my NERS 515 uh, radiation detection and measurement course. I'm studying for my final. <clears throat> yeah, Knoll is a phenomenal textbook. We have an entire shrine to Greg or to Glenn Knoll, excuse me, in my workspace. So I feel like this KEV bit is right, but I'm not confident about where this distance term goes, you know? And this is in silicon, for what it's worth. We are not necessarily working with silicon. But the units... <clears throat> the units are in KeV per micrometer. So... And this is going to be, what, 200, 300, 400, 500? Yeah, so this should be like 120, 125 or so. One, one ish, one, yeah. The point being, um, for what it's worth, I feel pretty good about this, this part. I just don't know where I'm getting the distance term from here. And I have a feeling it has something to do with, um, the angle or the thickness. What if I instead solved for... What if I multiplied this by... Well, no, hang on. Let me think about this one more time. This is... yeah. 11.9... It's asking... This problem is asking for find the dead layer thickness in terms of unit... Units of alpha energy loss. So this is energy, and this is loss. So I think this is right. That's what it should be. I just don't know if it should be negative, necessarily. But like, if you think about it in the physical sense of things, the alphas are losing energy. So in the grand scheme of things, when you have your when you have your alphas coming in, right? Excuse me. Let me try this again. So here's our surface, right? And you have your alphas. They're going to come in here, like like, excuse me. 
Um, like, it, it makes the thickness different, and, like, the alphas are going to come in that way, you know? So it's it's a matter of alpha energy loss in that regard. So this is this negative sign is just a formality when it comes down to it, because it's just describing the energy loss. Yeah, it descends on the sign in the original equations. I would agree. I'm just trying to convince myself whether I believe in this number or not. So, I do think this isn't the proper magnitude for what it's worth. <laughs> I think this is the proper magnitude. I feel content with this number, all things considered. Um, what I could do to check myself, though, is instead of solving for t, I could solve for uh, n, or I could... Shouldn't I have done c2 minus c1? I did. Oh! You are right. Thank you. That was my mistake, and that's why my sign is negative. Thank you. That is actually it, Dami. Thank you so much. So, yes. If you switch these, let me just, uh, let me do the freeform thing, and we'll... Yes, I got my C1 and C2 mixed up. That was it. That was the problem all along. That's what it is. Hooray! Wow. Just stupid sign errors from working too fast. Awesome. So let's just drag that in there. Good catch, thank you so much. And that is why we uh, do these live, so that you can see the mistakes. Curry makes a bad curry, you're so right. But that means that this is a positive, and that is what we're looking for. Okay, cool. Then yeah, I would feel good with this answer. One of the UM calc professors. I have not had to take a math class here at UM. Fun fact. Oh. All right, time for a doodle. What should I draw? Mental reset. Whomst should I draw? Um. Uh, one sec. Let's see. Okay. Uh, draw Goku making love to Spider-Man. No. No, I don't think I will. Uh, let's, let's draw... Draw Fission. Sorry, did you say Fission? I enjoy some fishing, let me tell you that. Fishing season. Yeah, we'll draw Ditto, that's fun. And we'll go, woo hoo hoo, look at me, he's Ditto. And he's a nice, he's a nice, uh, pinkish color. Yeah, that's a good color. He's a nice, cool pink color. Oh, that's gonna color my entire canvas. Shiny? Oh, you too late. I've chosen this color already. There he is, there's Ditto. Wow. He's so freaking cool and epic. He's really excited because he's in the daycare. <laughs> wow, getting fancy with the colors. Oh, you know it, boss. MS Paint, baby. Oh yeah, baby, let's go. All right, let's save this guy and move on to the next one. This was 11.9. All right, <clears throat> next problem. Random number one, uh, random integer, because Snake is being a freaking pest, random integer between 1 and 256. Ah, yes, okay, Shane has hit the 144. 144. 
Let's have a look and see what 144 is. 144 is from 11.4, so we're gonna do another semiconductor problem. Semiconductors, baby, they are the future. All right, 11.4. Let's have a look. All right, let's have a dang look here. Okay, this one looks a little more straightforward, thankfully. Frankly, though, you know, the question we just did, I would not be shocked if I saw it on my final. <laughs> it's a good question to put on the final. Okay, by what factor is the rate of thermal generation for electron hole pairs in germanium reduced by cooling from room temperature to liquid nitrogen temperature? This is a really important question. <clears throat> hey, I work for a semiconductor company. Well, I'm working with CZT, so, for my research, so... Anyway. So, by what factor is the rate of thermal generation for electron hole pairs in germanium cool by cooling reduced from reducing room So this is really important. Excuse me, I need to blow my nose because it's freaking the thing. <laughs> Alright. <clears throat> this is a really important concept because you need to operate um, high purity germanium detectors at cryogenic temperatures because otherwise the thermal energy will create electrical noise from leakage current because the thermal energy will allow electrons and holes to move to the respective bands which therefore makes it so that you're going to get a signal when there really isn't one which definitely lowers the resolution of your uh, detector signal which is not what you want so you have to operate high purity germanium detectors at temperatures around 77 degrees kelvin and that's done by cooling them with liquid nitrogen or dewar. All right. So, so the probability, this one's pretty straightforward. The probability that a, per unit time, that an electron hole pair is thermally generated is given by CT to three halves, EXP of EG over 2KT, and this is a minus. Okay. Where T is temp absolute, so we'll work in Kevin. And so T1 is going to be 293 Kelvin, right? That's room temperature, right? That's 20 degrees C? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. And T2 is 77K. Cool. C is a constant, proportionality constant, so that will go away. Uh, EG is the band gap energy. For germanium, that should be 0 0.7 EV. Uh, K is the Boltzmann constant. Which I don't remember off the top of my head, but that's okay because it's going to go away in this problem, so it's fine. Uh, so the what factor is the it reduced? So we're looking for the ratio, ratio, <laughs> ratio uh, of P two, P T two over P T one. Really straightforward. So that just means that we are looking for ratio. Yeah, really. I don't know the Boltzmann constant. It's like freaking 2.718285, I don't know. Uh, so let's just do this. So this is gonna be C and T2, where T2 is uh, 293. So we're just gonna write 293 Kelvin. Kelvin. And then uh, to the three halves. And then EXP, which is just gonna be EG, which is a constant. And then minus 2K, 293. Over C. Oh, uh, that's Avogadro. Yeah, K doesn't cancel. Oh, damn it. You're right. You're right. Well, I guess I'll look it up in a little bit then. Ugh. Oh. Yeah. Um, I don't like that. I need to have my born to fish forced to work hat. So you were really gonna let me sleep through your stream? I didn't want to wake you up. That'd be rude to do. 
Ah. Avenir Rider, welcome. One hour change. Took me one hour to change my username, but to no avail. LMAO. Well, welcome to the stream. Took you one hour? That's, that is some time. 2K over 77. So immediately, these will cancel. And so we are left with 293 to the three halves. 293 over 77 to the three halves. And technically they're both Kelvin, but whatever. The units will cancel, so that's fine. And then we have EXP of we have minus EG of 2K 293 Kelvin minus this. Uh, that looks right. Still going to look it up, though. Uh, just because. Hey, Tay. Well, welcome. Taygeet VA, or Tay for short. Welcome. Glad you're here. Welcome to the stream. So this EG over 2K 77 Kelvin. <clears throat> That's going to be a plus. We can get rid of that. We'll get rid of all this, because who needs that? In this household, we like our minus minus plus business. Okay, so we basically will have two EGs. Those will cancel. I think I had this problem for a homework problem, actually, which is uh, why it's, you know, coming back to me pretty quickly. Did I write it backwards? I did. I really did. Okay. Uh, this is going to be to the minus three halves, and I'm a big, I'm a big fool. Look at this. All right. There we go. Problem solved. <laughs> all right. And then all we need to do is just actually... We just changed this to be... We were right all along. Okay, it's fine. Really fine, I promise. All right, so we're gonna just get rid of all this because I wrote my T1 and T2 backwards. <laughs> Let's see, we catch these things. This is, this is what we do, we catch these things. <clears throat> this is what we do. Yeah, homeboy out here including the units to the constant. It's it's important to include units, Shane. I mean, like, whatever, man. All right, so we have 0 0.7 EV over 2. Okay, what is the Boltzmann constant? Thought I was going to get away with not using it, but I need the Boltzmann constant. Let's figure it out. Boltzmann constant. Oh, Lord. I don't want that one. I don't want it in meters cubed kilogram per second per Kelvin. No, give me that in EV, please. EV per Kelvin, that's what I like. Okay. Equals 8.617 EV per Kelvin. Epic. Avenue Rider, thank you so much for the fire, for the follow. Hey, thank you so much for the follow. Welcome aboard. All right, so we got 8.167 EV per K times 293K minus 0 0.7 EV over 2.8167 EV per K over 77K. And this is our answer. I mean, like, we have numbers for everything, but of course they, you know, when when you when you work with scientists and engineers, they're all like, oh, what's, what's the real number here? So, uh, oh, and can't forget, can't forget, don't forget that. That's important. That's very important. Otherwise, you'll be off by a factor of that, and that's not good. You don't want that. I got a unit for you, dollars per hour. <laughs> yeah. Alright, so next we're gonna do E to the X of, here we go, 0.7 over 2, 2 times 8.617 times 293 minus 0.7 over parentheses 2 times 8.617 times uh, 7. And that ratio is 0 0.135. So when it goes from seven or from two, 
290 whatever it is 293 to 77 the probability of these thermally generated ion pairs goes from 1 to 0 0.135 really low and I'm pretty sure I've worked this one out before and I think that's what I got last time or maybe I'm just like way off. No, that's way too, that's not right. That's way too high. This needs to be lower. <clears throat> did I type this in wrong? There's a minus, nope. Where did, I, where did I go wrong? Where did I go wrong? I think I... Hold on. Let me just make sure. I think where I may have gone wrong here is I may have missed my minus sum. <coughs> yeah, I think there should be a minus sign in front of all of this. Oh, Lord. There should be a minus sign. That, I believe, is where the issue was coming in. Let me just see if that changes anything. Yeah, this is why I'm not a Dangin' Around for protagonist. I would have lost a lot of clout just there. No, that's still... Okay, where am I going wrong here? <clears throat> I felt good about it, but now I'm not as confident. So let's go through this step by step and see where I may have made a goof. All right, so we have this band gap energy, which like will kind of change a little bit, but not so much. And we have <clears throat> these need to be changed, I think. Yeah, so this should be seventy seven. This sh okay. So seventy seven's on top, and we're subtracting this. Okay. So this should be seventy seven. And this should be 290. Let's try that. Let's try th that <clears throat> and see what we get. I wanna, I wanna maximize the ratio to compensation to whatever. All right, let's try. 77 minus 293. I don't think this is going to change anything, though. Unless it's a very significant change, I don't think it's going to make a difference. My units work, so... Yeah. Right, because the probability... I haven't written this down wrong. Let's see, let's see, okay. <clears throat> so I have this, right? And this is, this is fine. Like, this expression here should work. So that to the three halves. And then this, EXP 77 minus this. I forgot times 10 to the minus five. 
and my bolts went constant. <sighs> it's always this fucking bolt that's constant. <sighs> Alright, so times 10 to the minus 5. So just add 10 to the minus 5 here. That's that's our mistake, everyone. Can you tell that I am prone to mistakes when I go too fast? Wow. Cool. And let's just put n the minus. All right. Let's try that calculation again. And get rid of that. And I'm willing to bet you a lot of money that this value drops significantly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because our new answer, which seems uh, far more likely, is 1.74 times 10 to the minus 18. That's far more likely. That's far more likely to be the right answer here. Because that's a way bigger drop. Or not percent, excuse me. Ignore the percent. That's not that's not important. The ratio, not a percent. Yeah. This is our answer. That's the ratio. Way lower. Uh, because when you're cooling it down, it's significantly less. So yeah, that makes more sense. Always good to gut check. Always good to gut check. That ratio we got before, too big. This, that's right. All right, what are we drawing? We're gonna draw the eye. I always start with the eyes. NT one Chan? No. No, 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 no. This guy just got a beard to it. So. Nope. Better idea. Better idea. Better idea. Better idea. Better idea. Just watch this. He's just gonna go. He's just. He's got really big feet. He's got. Really long. No, wait, that's not the thing. That's not the shape. Almost the shape, but not. He's got really long limbs, and they just sort of hang on the floor. He's a real character. He's got two elbow joints, you see? Right here and right here. Perfect. Oh, shit. Move this quick again. No! Work with me here. Okay, there we go. And here's his... Excuse me? Why aren't you drawing? Yatazo! Come on, man. Come on, man. The struggle. Alright, well... Alright, cool. So that worked. So why isn't my drawing tool working? Not sure why that's not working, but whatever. I guess that's our character. Save as 11.4. And I'm gonna close paint and open it again, so that that way 
Maybe it'll work again. Cool. All right. The next question we were given was 173. Thank you, Sadi. Very cool. So let's do 173. That is going to be 14.1. Something, something, One Piece. Uh, you'll have to talk to Aaron about that one. 14.1 is slow neutron detection methods. Lay it on me, baby. Discuss the feasibility of operating a BF3 or a helium-3 tube in the ionization or Geiger regions rather than as a proportional tube. What practical uh, di considerations dictate the latter choice? So this is one where like, it doesn't really make sense to talk or write it out. It probably makes more sense to like explain it. So, first things first, when it asks about the ionization regions and the Geiger regions, it's talking about the applied voltage. I'm going to draw this cool little diagram for you all so you can kind of get an idea for what I'm talking about. So gas-filled oper gas detectors operate in a couple different regions, and it's important to differentiate these regions because it's based on the applied voltage. The applied voltage, and this is going to be what is the unit over here? Should be like hold shift for intermediate angles in an interval of 15 degrees. What? Oh, what the hell? I never knew that. That's so cool. I didn't know that. All right. What is the units on this one curve? There's this one curve that I need to know, and I can't remember the vertical axis units, and it's gonna bother me. <clears throat> what is it, what is it, what is it, what is it? Oh my god, why can I not remember it? I thought I had committed it to memory, but clearly not. Okay, it's pulse amplitude. Alright, pulse amp. And it's in a log scale. Meaning that in order to go but up this, it's gotta be really significant growth, right? So there's a couple different regions that are worth knowing. And these two should form a single area here as it goes up. So, we have a couple specific regions. Nope, oh, not that. So first, we have, nope, not quite. Let's do here. <clears throat> yes, good. Ooh, not quite. There we go, and one more. So we have a couple major regions. And this curve is for two MeV energies, and this is for one MeV. The point of these two curves is to show kind of how the count rates will, or the pulse amplitudes for different energies can be measured. So we have these these different regions. First here is the ion is or ion uh, yeah iron saturation saturation. And here that's where it's very flat, and this is where ion chambers are used for gaseous detection. Uh, gaseous detectors. So we had the iron satura saturation where these are flat. Then we have this proportional region where in this, situ in this setting, the pulse heights will dramatically increase, but they will always have the same distance from each other. So this distance here is the same as this distance here. I've just drawn it really bad. And this is where we have proportional counters. This is the voltage at which proportional counters operate. Then we have this limited proportional region. And the issue here is that this height here is not the same as this height here making it really difficult to differentiate different energies over time. And typically we don't want to operate in this region whatsoever. 
because we really value the linearity at different energies. The last region we have is the Geiger-Muller region, and you may have heard about this. At this point, as you can see, these lines are virtually indistinguishable. You're still going to be able to get counts, but the applied voltage is so high, you're not going to be able to distinguish different energies. And this is really useful only if you want to know the specific counts from a source in general. And, you know, you might have seen a Geiger-Muller counter before. This is like the clicking noises you hear if, heard if you watched Chernobyl, for example. So these are GM tubes. So when the question asks the feasibility of operating, <laughs> you make wonderful background noise. Thank you. So the feasibility of operating a barium, um, a, excuse me, a boron trifluoride tube or a helium-3 tube in the ionization or Geiger regions. They're talking about this region and this region. Let me uh, highlight these, or here. And that just means that you're either operating at lower voltages or have very high voltages. High enough that you're not gonna be able to distinguish energies. Now, the thing about these neutron detectors <clears throat> is that you want to be able to also, for what it's worth, ion chambers also work as proportional detectors because they still have that proportionality. It's just that it's dependent on the region in which they're being operated. But ionization is where we want. We want to be in ion saturation. So in theory, we could also be in this area. So let's just highlight it all. These voltages right here. So it'll be from here to here. Ooh, that's bad. or up there. <clears throat> so if we're operating in the Geiger region rather than the proportional tube, we just have to make sure that the gas inside the detector, in this case the boron trifluoride, doesn't get damaged as a result of the applied bias. Um, that's really important. The other thing is that boron trifluoride is really good at differentiating different particles. Uh, in particular, the reaction that takes place when a neutron interacts in a boron trifluoride tube is it creates an alpha particle, or a helium nucleus, and a lithium nucleus. These two will have different energies, and they'll have different energy continuums. In particular, the spectrum that we expect to see from a boron trifluoride tube, a BF3 tube, if you will, is we'll see something like... Mm, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do... Let's do this. Shane, you are a lifesaver. Oh my god. So the spectrum that we expect from this is going to look something like this, probably. If if our detector is small, you know. Uh, and the reason for that is is we're going to have sort of just like a wall effect where they're not able to deposit all the uh, energy into the gas. Really straightforward. That's a whole whole other thing that you can get into here. Um, the point being that we want. This energy, and I believe this should be here. Right? Yeah. That should be the case. Let me just verify that for myself. Yep, DND. Cool. SPM, baby. Uh, and so, basically, you'll have some energy and some peaks and everything, and this will be at 2.31 MeV, uh, just from the reaction of the neutron hitting the boron and resulting in a lithium and an alpha. Really straightforward. This is going to be at 2.79 MeV. This is a uh, 0.84 MeV. And this is at 1.47. And these right here are just low energy uh, gamma events. So these are just gamma rays that appear. Uh, the nice thing about boron trifluoride tubes is that you're able to differentiate uh, these two different events happening, these alpha and these lithium events. And if you're operating in the Geiger-Muller region, you're not going to be able to differentiate these two. You're only going to see counts, which is not great. So we want to avoid that if possible. And that's why we want to operate in the proportionality region, because then the energy is directly proportional, and we can differentiate these guys. That's probably the most important thing to take away. Um, the other thing that we want to consider for helium... Helium is very similar, right? Because helium tubes... 
Helium tubes have a similar kind of spectrum, where... Oh, that's it. I want to do that, and that. Cool. Where again, the pulse height spectrum that we expect from helium is also pretty similar, and we are able to differentiate, again, events, because the helium reaction is where you have a neutron hitting helium, and it makes a proton, and an alpha, I want to say. Is that right? I need to check that. I don't want to be wrong here, because that's really important. The helium, it's neutron proton there. <clears throat> I think that's what it is. Hang on, let me look, let me look, let me look. I think, no, it just makes a proton and a neutron, I think. Let me just make sure I'm not lying to you here. Let me make sure helium neutron <clears throat> reaction. Helium-3 neutron reaction. Let's have a look here. <clears throat> Helium-3. Well, helium tritium decay. Helium-3 makes... Makes a tritium. Makes tritium. That's what it is. It's not a proton. No, it's, it's not a neutron. Excuse me. It's a neutron and tritium. Tritium is just a hydrogen nucleus uh, with a mass number of three. So it's got three neutrons. No, two neutrons. Yeah, tritium. Makes tritium. So, when we have our pulse height spectrum, we would once again expect to see, you know, something like this. No, mm, that's not it. Heaven help me. Something like that. Where again, this peak is at uh, 764 KEV. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we have. This, I believe, is at 573, and this is at, like, 191, because they need to add up. Yep, okay, cool. These are KEV. So again, and again, with, like, some wall effects. So the point being, again, helium allows us to differentiate these events when we operate at the appropriate voltages. If we, prop, if we work at um, Geiger region, in the Geiger region basically, we can't differentiate these guys. And that's not good. So ideally we want to avoid that. And we choose to operate them basically in the proportional region to make sure that we can identify these individual pulses. And that's also really important when we consider for the barium trifluoride, these low energy gamma events. If we're operating at the Geiger-Muller region, no matter what, if we get a lithium or an alpha event, we would get a count, but we'll also get counts from, from these gamma events, which we don't want. These gamma events are basically discriminatable. You can discriminate against them. And uh, please don't take that out of context. Um, basically though, you can choose a certain energy level and only measure upward from there. And then effectively ignoring all these counts because they don't add anything. These gamma events are just created from uh, basically gamma events interacting to create secondary electrons, which then deposit energy inside the tube. But they're always going to be very low energy because the secondary electrons, excuse me, very rarely are going to deposit any energy above, you know, a couple keV, uh, kilo electron volts. And as a result, uh, they are not relevant to the spectrum. They are not useful. So we can avoid them. We can discriminate against those because they are not important. Um, so yeah, that's, the, that's that problem. So one thing, I am out of water. So I'm going to be right back so I can get some more water. And we're going to make sure that that's good. All right. 
So I'm going to leave this running. I'm just going to get some water. We'll be back in just a moment. I hope Igor sees this so he can uh, be proud of me. Oh, and we need to do a sketch.
Okay, I have returned. I am here. I am ready to party. Are you ready to party? Because I'm... Oh my god, I'm so ready to party. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing, right? We, we do... We do a lot of math. Lots and lots of math. All right, let's get back into the business, right? Studio mode. Ba, 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 ba. I'm back! Whoa! All right, we gotta draw something. What are we gonna draw? What should we draw? Fire Emblem? Okay. Here, I'll draw Prom. Prom from Fire Emblem. Here he is, ready? All you subs out there, by the way, we have a new emote! If you're subbed, you can now use uh, this new cool emote, Chrome Bachelor, made by one Yo DPC. Very cool. So I'm gonna draw Chrome. He's pretty epic. He's a... He's a cool dude. Alright. He's like... No, he's, he's angry. He's, He's got, oh, his hair. He's, he's got that Fire Emblem hair, you know? You know the kind, right? You know the kind where he goes like, eh. He goes out a little bit. Up a little bit. No, that's not the right. Swoosh. Whoa, he's got the big one right there. Yeah. He just kind of goes down and around like this. Yeah, just, just like that. He looks just like this. It goes out. And back. No. Not quite. Yeah. Like that. Why do you think why do you think he's so angry? I think it's because he has no ass. No, that's not it. Yeah, there he is. That's that's Krom to an extent, but we need a No, that's not it. That's not the right angle. Yeah, something like this. And he and he's like got the oh look at me, I'm Krom. Oh I got the, I got the I'm Matthew Mercer voice. Oh. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, and like he's got this blue ass hair. Who has blue hair? Not me. And, you know, that, that, no, no, no. I don't like that. I like this better. It's a little more cartoony. It's, it's the vibe. Very cool. And then, uh, then what else? What else does he have? He's, uh, Tiny little arms. Tiny little feet. He's got. What the hell is he doing with these hands in this picture? He's like got. Uh, yep, that's that's how it is. And he's got his fingers wrapped around here. Yep, that's that's Krom. 
It sure is, man. And he's got... He's got like the opposite of a butt. Look, see? He doesn't have a butt. He has like the opposite of a butt. <laughs> Perfect. Look everyone, it's Crom Fire Emblem, see? He goes, hello. I'm Crom Fire Emblem. See? He's beautiful. And, you know what we could do? We can do... Wait. I could even maybe color in his hair. So that way you know that that's... Oh, oh wait. We'll go... Bonk. Oh, shit. Where's the freaking leak from? Ah, there it is. There. Problem solved. No. No. Yes. Yes. And then we just go... But about... Ooh, pow. Look, it's Krom from Fire Emblem. Look, it's Krom from Super Smash Brothers. Ah, his ear turned blue. That's not okay. No, now he's got a black ear. There. That's Krom from frickin' Fire Emblem. There we go. All right, let's save Let's save this guy. 14.1. All right, uh, next problem. It's too far back in the thing, so just give me another number. Integer between one and 256. Don't be afraid to go to the extremes. Thirty-four. All right. What is thirty-four? That is problem three point ten. Oh, it's a statistics problem. My favorite. Okay. Three point ten. Let's do this. Three point ten. In a given application, a ten-minute measurement. So T. 10 minutes uh, resulted in a statistical uncertainty of 2.8%. How much additional time must be allocated to reduce this statistical uncertainty to less than to 1%? All right. So the statistical uncertainty in this case, let's figure that out. This is literally just a, okay, so this is T1, and that yields a 2.7%, T2 equals, hmm, give us 1%, how much additional time, so it's the solution equals T2 minus T1. Okay, let's do some stats. This is a really important question because uh, you need to know that how long to measure to get statistical uncertainty. Uh, let's see. I believe, in general, uh, what a struggle this is. It's This one's just finding the equation. I need to be better about statistics. I'm always kind of bad about them. Where is... So, all right, well, let's think about this, right? So we have the counting statistics. So theta n over n. This is the error in our, the variance, excuse me, the standard deviation over the number counts is the same as square root of n over n, right? And n equal the rate 
of the counts times the time. I can tell you what track this is. This is from F-Zero. So, that's the same as 1 over the square root of n, which is 1 over rt, square root of rt. The square root of rt. And so, is it really just a ratio? I think it's just a ratio. So it's like 2.8% over 1.0% times T1? No. We need to square this though, I think, because in order to get rid of this term. Yeah, because Yes, yes, we need to get, we need to do it's going to be the ratio of this because we know that it's going to be this one squared t1 equals sigma 2 2 Jesus 2 squared t2 right Excuse me, this should be over n Let me just rewrite all this, uh, so it's a little bit more understandable. It's gonna be sigma one over n squared t one is equal to sigma squared two over n squared t two, and that's just the this is the definition of the error from accounts times this, and this gives us the time, and that's again given from the rate times the time. And this rate is described in the error. So it's going to be error rate times time, since that statistical analysis allows us to do that. So we're just using the basic uh, standard thing. So, all we need to do is do sigma 1 over n squared over sigma 2 over n squared t1 equals 2. Which we know, we know that this is just 2.8% over 1.0%. Let's try that again. Over 1% times 10 minutes. So that's going to be, it's going to yield us what? Uh, squared, excuse me. So 2.8 over 1.0. And I'm not doing anything to that because it's just a ratio. So that squared is going to be... 7.84 times 10 minutes. So if we want to reduce the statistical uncertainty of this, T2, we need to measure for 78.4 minutes. So that means that the time needed to add, so therefore T2 minus T1 equals 78.4 min minus 10 min equals 68.4 minutes. That's a lot of time. So, that was really straightforward, actually. Feel pretty good about that. What do we draw? What should we draw? Grinch getting suplexed by Santa? Oh boy. Alright, well, we'll start with Santa. The jolly old soul. What are you with his big beard? Actually, that makes it look. Like, here's what we'll do Santa's head, his lovely beard. And he's got his. Big, muscly arms. Uh, 
And look, he's a he's a stout fellow. And he's squatting, you know, as one does when he's a jolly old soul. Oh. Man. He's got his boots too. Can't forget those. This is Claus wouldn't let him leave the house without him. He's got double double tightness, because you know, it gets cold. Alright. That's Santa Claus. Without his hat, because the Grinch stole his hat. And the Grinch looks uh got this sort of point up here. Right? Like no. There's his tongue. His furry fucking body. Arms down on his sides. Yep, that's that's definitely it. And he's got his limp legs. And Santa Claus has got hang on. He's going like this, so his thumbs are gonna be out, okay. And then his hand goes back in there. And Santa actually has uh five. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then all we gotta do is just erase this. Woo Mm-hmm. I was. I really was. And and the Grinch is holding the cap in the background behind his head. Alright, there you go. Right hand rule hit different once we start drawing. Yeah. It's like he's going like this, right? So he's like lifting him up. All right, there's my there's my drawing. There he is, fucking loser. Merry Christmas, motherfucker. <laughs> Bada bop boop beep. All right, that was what three? What did we say? What was? That was three ten. All right. Next question. Another number, baby. Lay it on me. I'll RNG it. Whatever. Here we go. Number 230. Alright, number 230. That is number 17.21. Alright, let's do it. Alright, 17.21. Oh, fuck. This job is pulse processing and timing. Okay. A 12-bit sub-ranging ADC can consist of three stages with four bits each, or four stages with three bits each. Which configuration requires the to smaller total of comparators? If both... Um, if both configurations were operated at the same clock frequency, which would have the lower latency? Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, we can either have a 12-bit ADC, so three stages of four bits each. So we have four to the third, or four stages of three bits. So, 
So the smaller number of comparators means larger latency, and larger and lower latency means more compare. I believe it. But anyway, four to the third. Four bits with three stages means that there will be 64 here versus three to the fourth, which I believe is 48, 81. No, nice, All right. I don't think, therefore I am not. No, 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 because ignore this. This is not it. So a bit is a binary thing, right? So we have three stages of four bits each. So we have three times four, nope, times two to the fourth, right? Or we have four stages of two to the, I do that every time, of two to the third which is three times 16, or four times eight, which is 48 or 32. So this is gonna be the number of comparators. So this, this guy has fewer Comparators. However, if they're operating at the same frequency, which one's going to have the lower latency? I think it's this guy is going to have lower frequency or lower latency. <coughs> Excuse me, because that it, it has fewer stages. Three stages. So there's only three calculations that need to be made versus four. So while there are more comparators, there's only three stages, meaning that you're going to get, if they're operated at the same frequency, each stage is going to take the same amount of time. So as a result, the one with three stages is going to take less time than the fourth stage, but it's going to have more comparators. So yeah. That's really straightforward and easy. Ugh. All right, who to draw? I'm going to draw. Let's see. Let's let's draw a friendly person. This is a friendly person. I don't know who they are, or what their story is, but they seem like they've been having a bad day. Maybe a little rough around the edges. It's fine though. No one's gotta be perfect. Man's just having kind of a bad day. You know, some days we just have those days and that's just how it is. And he's got glasses. So. I've decided this man has glasses and that's final. Cool. Also, bug eyed.
There. That's 17.21. All right. How long am I going for? Two and a half hours? Do one more. Last one. Last one. Any numbers? I'll do it. I got a random number. Here we go. 104. That is 8.2. All right, we'll wrap this up with 8.2. 8.2. Okay. Scintillators. All right. Let's do this. Assuming a decay constant of 230 nanoseconds, how much time is required for a sodium iodide thallium dub scintillation event to emit 99% of its total light yield? Oh, this is a really easy one. He says, knowing that it's going to take a lot longer. Um, the light yield, if I'm remembering this properly, it should just be a like I, I not, e to the minus, uh, that something like that right i'm pretty sure that's all it is because it's light yield no it's this that's... yeah because uh the decay constant is a in nanoseconds so it needs to be divided by that okay so how much time really easy okay so i over i naught will equal 0.99 so we have 0 0.99 equals e to the minus, which should be t over tau. This is t, and that's tau. <laughs> that's minus t over tau. So the natural log of 0 0.99 equals minus t over tau. So minus tau natural log of 0 0.99 equals t. So we just plug it in and solve. Our tau is 230 nanoseconds. Natural log of 0 0.99. That will be a negative number, so we should get a positive time. Very, very easy. Very straightforward. Minus 230 times the natural log of 0 0.99. That is going to be t equals, here I'll move it down, T equals 2.312 nanoseconds. And if we want to check, let's just put it in. So we have I over I naught equals E to the minus 2.310 nanoseconds over 30. Let's just check that. E to the minus 2.312 over 230 gives us approximately 0 0.99. All right, really easy. And for our final drawing, I'm going to draw you. That's right, I'm going to draw you, viewer. You are sitting at your computer. Your hair is indeterminate. Maybe you don't have hair. I don't know. It's your life, not mine. But you're watching. They're watching me. On your beautiful computer monitor, you're watching a dude in a hat. See, there's me. There I am. Uh, there's me. I drew me. And here's my chair in the background, and here's chat.
Hello. Oh no, my tablet disconnected. Uh, fuck me. Now of all times? Excuse me, not my tablet, Aaron's tablet. Work with me, please. Come on, come on, please. Work with me. No. <clears throat> come on. Almost. Looking quite... Oh, well, thank you, Lacey. I'm glad you feel that way. Yeah, I'm moving the cable around. <clears throat> We're making it work. There we go. Ah, I see what the issue is. There we go. All right, we're back in business. Also, you're watching on Twitch, which means... No. Which means you're watching on your... No, I don't want to turn on sticky keys. So you got the chat over here too. And I'm over here drawing you watching this stream. Here I am with my fish hat. And uh, I'm drawing you watching this stream. And you're, you're moving, you're moving your hands on the mouse to click that motherfucking like button. And look, oh, it's your mouse. Look, it's moving to the, the appropriate spot. You're, you're, you're sitting here. Minding your business. I don't know, maybe you got a friggin' drink in your hand or something. So your thumbs here and you got your hands back here. Yeah. Yeah. You're vibing, you know. In the Ritz cars and you and you got your hand on your mouse. It's moving down off to the side here. Yeah, so you got your fingers here. And you're and you're moving to click that like button. Yeah. Like and subscribe and follow. Ha <laughs> In that in that grand. But yeah, that's gonna be the uh end of this one. But yeah, we did a bunch. We did a, a lot of them. We did a lot of the things today. We did one, two, three, four, five, six. We did eight. Eight problems. Oh fuck, I I dang goofed. Alright, well. My work for 17.21 is now gone. Oh well. So with that, we are gonna call it here, because I do have some things I need to do today. I need to go work with my partners on some projects. I need to type up how high priority germanium detectors work. I need to read some papers and I need to do other things. So we're going to, we're going to wrap it up here and it's going to be good. So we're going to end the stream. Thank you so much for tuning in. I wonder if there's anyone we can raid today. Let's find out. I don't know who'd be streaming on a Sunday afternoon, but 
Hey, I am too. No one that I know is streaming. So I don't really want to send this to like random places or whatever. Let's see who's playing Phoenix Wright. We'll just... Uh, no. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll just call it here then, I think. Because, uh... <clears throat> That's really about it. I, I, I don't want to send anyone to anywhere I don't know, so we'll wrap it up here. Thanks for watching. I don't know if I'll stream before my finals are over again, but this was a really fun uh, opportunity. And I'm glad that I got to share it with all of yous. Hope you all are seeing what I'm going through. So, with that, see you all for uh, another stream later. Bye-bye.